All right, good morning everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School and welcome to the book of Joshua, A Type and Shadow. Um, in these lessons we are discovering more of how the book of Joshua is filled with types and shadows of other things such as the kingdom of God, the, the eternal Christ, and the finished work. And we're seeing that constantly as we're going through this book. Um, as we look in the Old Testament, many people often think that the book of Joshua and other Old Testament books would not contain such uh, so much revelation of the eternal truth established by Father God in eternity past, and who declared the end result of you, of who you are, who you were created to be, even from the beginning. So as we continue this verse-by-verse -verse study, it is very important to look at all scriptures through the proper interpretive lens, which I have determined is Father's eternal and unconditional love for his creation. Therefore, it is my goal in these studies that we look and see uh, what Father was trying to reveal within an old pe a people long ago, even as he was interacting with their version of the journey of their human experience. So let's get started as we dig deep into the well of Father's mind within and see more types and shadows and symbolic messages from the book of Joshua. So we are in lesson number 29. Uh, thank you for everybody joining us. We appreciate you so very much. Um, whether you see this now while it's live or catch it later while it's on um, while it's uploaded online. Uh, I, we, we so appreciate you very much, okay? So anyway, uh, we are uh, in Joshua chapter 6, verses 18 through 21. And I'm going to read them from the New King James Version to start with. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed thing or accursed thing, uh, lest you become accursed with uh, when you take of the accursed thing. Uh, we'll just call it accursed um, or, or accursed. Uh, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold, the vessels of bronze and iron, are consecrated or set apart to the Lord. They shall come or shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted with the priests, uh, and the, when the priests blew the trumpets, and it happened that when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the, the, the voice of God, and the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Uh, verse 21, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, uh, young and old, ox and sheep, and donkey with the edge of the sword. Now, uh, as we uh, research, uh, what we find out is there was a man by the name of Joseph Benson. Uh, he wrote the Benson Commentary. Uh, he lived from 1748 uh, to 1821. He was a prominent Methodist preacher in England, and he says that when these words say to abstain from the accursed thing, uh, this should rather be rendered the devoted thing, which speaks of the spoils of devoted, uh, spoils devoted to the Lord. So when we talk about the devoted thing, uh, that really makes sense. When we talk about the accursed thing, to a lot of people, that seems to be something super, super evil. Okay, uh, so uh, what we need to understand is that these verses in the English language show us the human form version or the view of how God saw things. It's the human form version of how God saw things, but not necessarily the truth of Father's mind. Any opinion or view of something or someone can be conjured up from the imagination, uh, the human imagination. So it would be like mankind's view, uh, mankind views the image of God through their hardships, all right? And all of a sudden, a good God becomes an evil ogre within the thinking of humanity. So it's not that God is an evil ogre, it's not that father is bad or mean. It's that it's mankind's view of God 
through their human experience, through their hardships. Now, based on the passage we just read, uh, to become accursed, uh, it is said to bring you under the same sentence of destruction as the inhabitants and things that Jericho was under. So that really is an important uh, perspective to, to consider. So then to make the whole camp of Israel a curse was thought to be done by provoking God to punish them for their sin, uh, and they thought that God might take uh, might take whatever occasion he saw fit to inflict this punishment upon them. Well, although this was not God's thoughts toward his creation, this very idea was both forth uh, uh, was was birthed forth from within the thinking of the carnal mind even though all mankind was created by God. Now, we've heard this verse multiple times through many lessons, especially that I have done. Uh, but Colossians 1.21 in the New King James says, And you, who were once alienated and enemies in your own mind by wicked works. Whose wicked works? Their own wicked works. Yet now he has reconciled. So in this New Testament, in the New Testament, this was Paul's revelation that he shared uh, to the believers at uh, what we call Colise. It's it's Colosse, Colosse, um, uh, 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 who also thought they were somehow distant from God, uh, which was a, a result of the Adam mind. All right. Now, Colossians 1.21, once again, in the, in the Passion Translation, and I say once again because I've used it so many times, says, even though you were once distant from him, here's how, living in the shadows of your own evil thoughts and actions, he reconnected you back to himself. So that's what the cross was all about. That's what the place of Golgotha or the place of the skull in the Aramaic the place of the skull, the mind, the hippocampus, the place of the memory, reconnecting us to our God mind, uh, reconnecting our memory. Now, the fact is that mankind was never separated from God at any time. However, often in the human experience, mankind has been known to feel alone and attempts to reinterpret the creator's view of them. Now, in Joshua 6, verse 18, it says, And you, by all means, abstain from any accursed thing, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. All right. The, pat, the, the New English translation that I use uh, in the, these lessons all the time uh, says, But be careful when you... Uh, verse 18, be careful when you are setting apart the riches for God. If you take any of it, uh, then you will make the Israel Israelite camp subject to annihilation and cause a disaster. Now, a translation note says that the Hebrew could read, only you keep away from what is set apart to God so that you might not, as you are setting it apart, Take some of what is set apart to God and turn the camp of Israel into what is set apart and, and turn the camp of Israel into what is set apart to, to destruction by God and bring trouble on it. Okay, so some pretty fancy words, um, uh, some things that we, we know and see um, on a regular basis when it comes to uh, Israel, and it comes to all of the things that uh, the the human perspective is seeing here. Well, one of the things we want to notice as a, a, a translation, a translator's note uh, explains. Here's what a translator's note is: it explains the rationale for the translation and gives alternative translations, interpretive options, and other teaching uh, technical information. So remember that only Rahab and her household was spared because she had faith in the living God uh, of Israel. As far as to abstain from the accursed things, Joshua had to command the people of Israel to stay away from the accursed or, based on other studies, the devoted things. All right, so in other words, 
it's not something that has a curse on it. It's not evil. Uh, but when you t and there's a reason they took it, and and we'll 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 get into that. Uh, but we want to understand that this word English word accursed comes from the Hebrew word karem, karem, uh, which was interpreted by the Strong's Concordance in the 1800s, 1890 to be more exact, 1890, 1891, as meaning to devote to religious uses, okay? Actually, accursed refers to something consecrated to the Lord being the same as devoted to the Lord. Now, the stuff, okay? So they're, they're going through uh, all of uh, they're going through all of uh, of uh, the, the 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 places these camps these cities in uh, in the land of Canaan uh, and and they're they're taking stuff now there's a reason why all of this is happening even though this is an Old Testament perspective there's still some allegorical uh, 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 versions of this even though we see the historical. Now, the stuff taken from Jericho was both accursed and devoted. It was accursed uh, when it was used um, uh, 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 okay, let, let, me, let me go back here. Uh, it was accursed when it was used uh, uh, through the mind of mistaken identity or to serve self, okay? So this is very important. Now, it was devoted when it was put into the treasury that was set aside for the Lord, which was used for his service or based on his instructions. Some say that accursed refers to the idols and things associated with diabolical and wicked worship that took place among the people of Canaan. So, Here's all this evil worship. In other words, whatever they're worshiping, you can call it evil, you can call it all kinds of stuff, but if they're not worshiping the living God, uh, then it's accursed, okay? So that's why that was set apart for God. Now remember that Canaan refers to the wandering tribes of the land with no stability at all. Well, the wandering tribes is an allegory for the wandering thoughts of the mind uh, of mankind. And, and this shows us that the thinking of mankind needs to be stable and focused, but not scattered and dis distorted. You know, this is one of the problems people still have today. Um, and, and it's not a bad thing in terms of saying that people are bad because their, their thoughts wander. Uh, it's, it's just saying that uh, there are times that people have trouble with their thoughts, right? And so the fact is, is that everybody at one point in their lives have had this issue. Now, when our thoughts are not focused on Father's thoughts from within the Christ mind, then our actions can seem to display a type of wandering mind that is out of control. In other words, our actions are not focused because our mind is not focused. Our thoughts are not focused. Now, it's said that severe judgment was brought against Jericho and all Canaan uh, did not, uh, uh, and all of Canaan did not come because they were in the way of God's people, but because this was a people who were totally in rebellion against God, and they were in a mental harmony with recovered artifacts from that time period, and they worshipped and idolized those ob objects. Now, that, that's what we would call idol worship, uh, or to worship the worship of idols. So, so when we're talking about these these artifacts, we're actually talking about things uh, that literally um, uh, were were grabbed, idolized, worshipped, adored, and so on. Well, as far as all of the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron, uh, this was all consecrated to the Lord. It's almost like where we display evil actions based on evil thinking, and then all of a sudden we pull that those thoughts, we organize those thoughts, and rid ourselves of, of the, the bad ways or the evil ways, and we say, things in order before the Lord. Well, that's kind of a similar similarity here. Now, this was a custom of that day where Jericho, under the law, gave and preserved the first fruits of the harvest of the wicked city of Canaan 
and in this case Jericho, and therefore the valuables were set apart and placed in the treasury of the Lord to be used for uh, whatever the Lord instructed at a later time. Now, Joshua chapter 6, verse 19 in the Net Bible says, All the silver and gold, as well as the bronze and the iron items, belong to the Lord. They must go into the Lord's treasury. A translation note here says that the Hebrew could read, It is holy to the Lord. Why? Again, it was like evil ground taken back into the Creator's hands, okay? Something used for something other than what God intended. Now, again, this doesn't make a lot of sense for me today because this is not how we operate. But but in that day, they went to war literally to take something away from the hands of evil and to bring it uh, as holy before the Lord. So what they had set aside belonged to God, and Israel was devoted to keep the covenant of the Lord in this way. Now, as we look at Joshua chapter uh, 6, verse number 10, all right, um, uh, I'm sorry, verse number 20, uh, it says, the ram, this is the Net Bible, the ram's horn sounded. And when the army, or again, the Hebrew says the people, when the people heard the signal or the sound, they gave a loud battle cry or a shout. Here's what the scripture says, the wall collapsed. Or in other words, it fell in its place. This is very important here. I'm not done with the scripture, but this is very important to understand. If you're looking at the walls, uh, they didn't come tumbling down, but they fell down flat. Okay? Uh, and the warriors charged straight ahead into the city and captured it. Now, first of all, the Net Bible footnotes has a, tr a text critical note here marked by a TC in the the the, the, the um, the Net Bible, showing that the Hebrew could read, and the people shouted, and they uh, blew the ram's horns. The same footnote also says the initial statement, and the people shouted, seems premature, since this verse goes on to explain that the battle cry followed the blowing of the horns. Thus, the statement has probably been accidentally duplicated from what follows. Now, uh, a, a, t a text critical note uh, discusses alternate or variant readings found in various manuscripts and groups of manuscripts of the Hebrew Old Testament and Greek New Testament. Okay, so that's just a definition of what that means. Now, when the people heard the shout or, or the sound of the horns, the Hebrew says they shouted with a loud shout. If you can imagine for a moment, so can you just take your mind back to that time period, if you would just imagine, because you've seen a lot of uh, movies from that century. Uh, Joshua died about four, uh, about 1245 uh, BC. So in, in the 1200s BC, uh, here's, here's what I want you to see. Imagine the walls surrounding the city of Jericho or of a city and you're walking around it, and all of a sudden on that seventh lap, on the seventh day, the walls, it's not a rumbling and a tumbling down, but all of a sudden the walls surrounding the city of Jericho did not fall because of giant equipment brought in to take it down. They didn't bring in massive bulldozers or 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 excavation tools, uh, heavy equipment. The scripture says that when the people marched around the seventh day, uh, but now seven times, and on the seventh time around, they broke silence. So six days in a row, they went around one time, completely silent. On the seventh day, six times around, completely silent. But on the seventh time around, they broke silence and shouted with all their might. Now, I want you to get this picture, how great a miracle this is. And the priests blew the seven trumpets or horns. And a translator's note uh, says that the Hebrew would read that the walls fell in its place. Imagine, just think about that a moment. Let it sink in. It wasn't because Israel 
brought anything with them, such as heavy equipment or catapults or anything. We, we went over that a few lessons ago. But it was that they just simply obeyed God. So this seventh time around on the seventh day, the people shout with a great shout as they're walking around this final lap. And the seven priests blow the seven trumpets or the seven ram's horns as they're going around this seventh time. And all of a sudden, the walls just like sink into the ground. They fall down flat. Well, it was clearly a demonstration of the power of Almighty God and the obedience of the people. Now, listen, when, when the walls fell down flat, we know that, that that is exactly the case because as soon as the walls went down flat, the scriptures say in multiple translations that the people went straight in. So they just walked straight in. No, now, in taking the city of Jericho, it happened when the people heard the sounding of the trumpet. Again, hearing the sounding of the trumpet is a, a metaphor for hearing the voice of God. They already had the Ark of the Covenant with them, so the presence of God was there. And when the people shouted with a great shout, that was when the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, and the scriptures say each one straight ahead, and they captured the city. Now the Israelites utterly destroyed uh, all that was in the city, both men and women, young and old, uh, ox, sheep, donkeys, with the edge of the sword, the scripture says. Well, when the wall fell down flat, this was clearly a miracle beyond any normal expectation, and they, uh, there was no history of any other city being conquered in this way. It doesn't exist, only in this, uh, in this situation. Now, Israel could not depend on their prior experiences so they had nothing to relate to. They had, uh, they could not depend on what happened for other armies in battle. So there was no record among these millions of people of anything like this. All that Israel had was God's promise, as stated in Joshua 6, 5. And they believed that uh, promise and acted according to that belief. Joshua 6, 5, if you'll recall, said, and it came to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. So this was the instruction of the Lord. Not only the instruction, but what an encouragement. The uh, Almost really prophetic as Joshua is speaking to the people about what God has said, and here's how it's going to happen. Okay, so they're getting this in their thinking, they're getting this in their mind, and so powerful. Now, no one should ever be surprised when you see what God has said and it manifests before you. You know, what we're talking about here is belief. So what do you believe? Do you believe if God said it, it's a fact? If God said it, that's it? Well, for me, I believe because God said so. So as I discover what God said, and that's specifically about me in eternity past and about his creation. If God said it, that's it. That's good enough, okay? Well, oftentimes we might wonder if the Israelites were surprised when the wall fell down flat, and they probably were. Well, notice as we move to Joshua 6, verse 21, in the Net Bible, it says, They annihilated with the sword everything that breathed in the city, including men and women, young and old, as well as cattle and sheep and donkeys. Now, a translator's note here says that the Hebrew could read, All which was in the city. So, here's the thing we want to consider. Why was Israel commanded to practice such complete destruction? Well, it was because of the great sins of the Canaanites uh, who were what uh, was traditionally known as spiritual sins. Uh, now, we know that sins ultimately is defined as to be mistaken or to be in error or to have mistaken identity of who God is and how he feels about you. Well, here's the thing. I personally, I did a lesson several weeks ago about how God feels about death, destruction, about war, and so on. 
And so this was really a concept out of out of man's idea. Did they have to actually destroy and kill the people? Uh, no, I, I I really believe that that was not the case. That of something they had to do. Uh, but it was their view or their version of how they heard God. Now, here's the thing. This was the instruction given by God as viewed by uh, the New King James Version of the Bible in Deuteronomy 18. Uh, I want to read verses 9 through 14. Uh, it says, When you come into the land uh, which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the ambitions or the dis detestable acts of these nations. The, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft or soothsaying, or one who interprets omens, uh, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritualist, or one who calls up uh, the dead. Uh, for all who do these things are abomination or detestable to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God uh, drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you will dispo dispossess or take away, listened to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed you or allowed you to do such for you. Uh, so when verse 10 says, there shall not be found among you any uh, uh, one who, who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, this means to be burned as an offering or an idol. So we call this judgment. Now, judgment did exist in the Old Testament because they believed in the punishment of God or a God of punishment. Well, such judgment seems harsh uh, to us because it is harsh, okay? It is harsh. And we must recognize uh, 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 that the distinctive moments in our lives, God has commanded or instructed us to do a certain thing or, uh, or for some reason, we just disobeyed. I want you to think about this because here we have all of Canaan. In this case, uh, we have Jericho who has disobeyed the Lord. They've worshiped false things. And so, okay, we get it. Now, here's the thing. Did a curse come on you because you disobeyed? Here's the result. No. But in the Old Testament, they believed that such judgment comes to pass because of disobedience. Now, can you disobey God today? Can you disobey God and in essence get away with it in terms of God? The answer is yes, but there are consequences. So really a person's not getting away with disobedience or, or coming against God. It's not God doing the punishing, but it's the consequences of our actions that create problems for us. So let's talk about this a moment. When a person disobeys the voice of Father within, what I think happens is that we fall under guilt and condemnation from old belief systems and we find something going wrong in our lives lives, and we call that the judgment of God. All right? So think about that. I do something wrong. I, I become disobedient. I take it further. I just, I just really mess up my life, and uh, things go bad for me. And so in my religious view, I call that the judgment of God. Here's the problem. It's not the judgment of God, uh, but certain, uh, certainly he can use the incident uh, as an opportunity for a course correction in our lives, especially in our thinking. All right, so the bottom line is that Israel took the city even as God had told them, or jo uh, God had told Joshua it would be. In Joshua 2, uh, 6, verse 2, it said, And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hands, its king and its mighty men of valor. So it was clear that God gave uh, 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 but also Israel had to take it by obedience. Now listen, God gave it, but Israel had to take it by uh, obedient and persistent faith in the word of the Lord. Uh, we might call this works. 
Uh, and people say, well, it's not about works. Well, it's not about doing the works of the law. It's not about that if I do A, B, and C, then God is required to bless me. It's not about that at all. Uh, but it was, um, uh, it, it, and, and there is a difference, okay, between doing works or laboring and laboring as unto the law. Now, when it comes to the victories in our lives, uh, the Lord gave all things to us. Uh, the scripture says that he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he's given all things to us in our union with the eternal Christ. So uh, we have to learn to rest in that union. We have to learn to rest in that uh, relationship. I was explaining to my wife last night that uh, just randomly it just came up in my mind and I paused the, the, uh, the program we were watching and I told her when I study, there is such a peace and a knowing within me that I'm hearing the voice of God and I'm communicating. Now, I do pray in terms of communication with God. I define prayer as communication between two people in love, and I communicate with the Lord but uh, verbally. But, but there are times, especially when I'm studying, I literally have such a knowing, the, the voice of God on the inside, that there's this this conscious communication going on uh, as I'm trying to uh, put A, B, and C together in scriptures and connect the dots and, and interpret and translate and so on. So there, there are times uh, even in that relationship that we uh, must take or receive or accept it, whatever he does for us, uh, from him by obedient and persist persistent faith. Now, what I mean by that is this, that uh, do I obey God? Yes, absolutely. Uh, is it by faith? Well, we take it by faith or we receive and accept it by faith. But what are we accepting? Well, the scriptures say in Ephesians 1 verse 3 that, that he has given us all things um, uh, uh, that um, uh, through the eternal Christ. Uh, we have been given all spiritual blessings through the heavenly Christ. Okay, it's uh, the scriptures say heavenly places in Christ, but it's actually translated uh, in the heavenly Christ, or we could say the eternal Christ. But we have all spiritual blessings. Everything that is was created in the spirit realm, and we call it into being in the natural realm. Uh, I, I, I really believe that it's important that we understand that healing and health is ours, that financial blessing is ours, that mental health is ours, that uh, re the right relationships are ours, and it's important that we re re realize that we know they're ours, and too often we pray and ask God for that which is already ours, instead uh, what we need to do is is just receive or accept it by faith, believing that what God has said is exactly the way it is, right? And so when we do that, uh, we, we literally uh, receive or accept or embrace, and we rest in the fact of what God has given us. And in that, uh, in that instance, things manifest. Not because we're striving for it or laboring for it, but we receive. That's the works of faith. We receive. We accept it by faith. Same thing with Israel. They accepted what God has said. Now, why kill all the people, the animals, and take the stuff and so on? The allegory here, or the way to look at this, a type and shadow, is that literally we're taking back uncontrolled thinking and casting down imaginations and bringing every thought uh, into agreement with the mind of God. That's really the case today. That's the lesson to be learned today. So I hope you got something from this lesson. Join me next time for more on the book of Joshua, A Type and Shadow, as this verse-by-verse -verse study continues. All right? Uh, have a great day. I'll see you next time. Also, let me say that um, uh, next uh, uh, tomorrow night, Pastor Paul Gray will be joining me from Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, and then also Friday, Apostle Brian Christian will be back with me. So we'll see everybody then. Have a blessed uh, day. And uh, we love you all. Bye-bye, everyone.